It happens every day across America. There's a judge who utters a few words, the gavel is dropped, and a child receives a new family through adoption. And it's kind of a a bittersweet moment. You see this, the family was either unfit to care for their child, or perhaps they were unwilling. Uh, Maybe they were unable. Uh, And whatever their determination, this child gets brought into a new family. And it is beautiful because in this moment, these parents accept full responsibility for this child. And this child is then fully belonging to this new family. But sadly, many children in this adopted state, they begin to question once the gavel is is rung and the, the announcement has been made of adoption, they question whether this new home will last. Are they really part of the family and will they really belong to this family and will it be their forever home? And we were going through a lavish series and we started by talking about the grace that God lavishes over us that we did not deserve. And then last week, Pastor Drew talked about the fact that even while we were enemy, enemies of God, he poured his love over us. He lavished us with love. And so the question today is, you might be wrestling with is, do I really belong to God? Is God really my forever family and will heaven be really my forever home? How do you deal with that? And so today I want to take us into the book of Galatians and begin to tackle this question. And I I believe if you will listen carefully and let God's word speak to you, you can walk out today encouraged by the truths of what the scriptures reveal. So um, I want to give you a little background before we jump right into Galatians, because sometimes you come into a book and remember we're in the middle of a letter. So Paul, the Apostle Paul, writing to Galatians, this is a Roman province to modern day Turkey region, for those who know their their geography. And uh, he's speaking, he's having to speak to both the, the Jews who have been, you know, come to faith in Christ, but also the Gentiles who've come to faith. And so he's always going back and forth in many of his letters, having to speak to these different groups of people because they have different cultural experiences and realities. They, they come to the, to the scriptures with a different background. And so we have to keep that perspective. This book, Galatians, is him, Paul, constantly challenging their beliefs. It seems that, that both, whether they came from a Jewish law background or a pagan root as a Gentile, they kept wanting to go back to some of their old habits, their old way of thinking. So they continually seem to fall back into idolatry or religious duties uh, or legalism in an attempt to find the, the just standing with God and to prove themselves worthy to God. And so this letter really addresses over and over again these these challenges. And throughout the book, of course, he reminds them of their identity. And I want to help you as well today, using his words to to bring the same cautions, be careful, and what is your identity. So we're going to go into chapter four. If you want to open up there, Paul's just been laying out a whole case for what it means to be in Christ. And he starts in chapter four on verse one with this. He says, I mean that the heir, as long as he is a child, is no different from a slave, though he is the owner of everything. But he's under guardians and managers until the date set by his father. In the same way, we also, when we were children, were enslaved to the elementary principles of the world. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So you're no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. There's a lot to unpack, and there's a lot of understanding, but there's a beautiful story that gets to be revealed today in God's lavish nature, how he lavishes us with something so incredible. But first, we have to start with the reality. And the reality I want to start with today is that one, you were a slave. You were a slave. Now, if you are in Christ, if you placed your faith in Christ, the finished work on the cross, declared him as Lord and Savior, surrendered your heart to him, then you are no longer a slave. 
And this this whole book goes over and over again to unpack that. But if you are not in Christ, if you have not placed your faith in him, then Paul in his writing would say to you, then you are still a slave. You're still trapped in a system. And this system is fraught with problems. And so maybe you're asking, well, then what was I a slave to or what am I a slave to? And the reality is that even in Christ, we often are tempted to fall back into different forms of this being a slave, a slave. So let's unpack this a little bit together today and talk first, what does this mean? So he starts off and he's, he's addressing specifically the Jews because he's going to talk about this idea that, that there's a, an understanding that the law, so for you and I who maybe weren't Jewish, have the Ten Commandments. You, know, you shall not kill and you don't steal and have no other gods before me. He lays this out. He says, you were a slave under that because what the law did was revealed the sin within us only to the point to say, look, you cannot fulfill the law. You can't do it. You're, you're not perfect and holy. And so you are a slave ultimately to sin and death, to sin and and death. And, and if you look at the, the text here, I underlined that we were enslaved to the elementary principles of the world. There's different translations take this differently, and it's, it's, it's a complex one. I don't want to spend our whole time here because the essence of this truth is that apart from Christ, we are a slave to something. We are a slave to something. So there's two kind of ideas of the elementary principles. One is just the basic foundations of the law, that, that ultimately the law revealed that we were broken, that we were imperfect, we were not holy like God. And so because of that, people then began to try to earn God's favor, to find justification, to become right with God by living up to the perfection of the law and everybody falls short. But Christ comes, of course, and, and is the one who fills that perfection. So, so ultimately, we're a slave to sin and ultimately death without Christ. And then, of course, the secondary one, there's, there's also, if you read further down in the Scripture within this book of Galatians, just a few verses beyond what I've read today, there's also an idea of spiritual forces or idolatry or false gods that, that we become enslaved to that as well. But in the context of this, he says, look, there was a reason for the law, and it was like a guardian over you. And this idea of when you were a child, this isn't about um, your age. This was uh, an, a concept, a Jewish concept, but also good for us that there was a time when uh, they were looking forward to the coming Messiah. And so the text here, he's trying to make the point that you were like, it guarded you to reveal your need for the Messiah. It was like a, a parent over you or like someone who managed you and you didn't have full access yet, but, but that day was coming. So I have to understand this, any time that we attempt to obtain salvation in our own energy, any time we try to follow a false God in our own ways, in our own self-sufficiency, we become a slave to that or it becomes idolatry. And then for you and me, if we're in Christ, there's another problem. There's a temptation in this idea. And Paul addresses this. This is the essence of this letter is, why do you keep going back to those things? You are freed out of the law in Christ, but you go back and try to live out days like the Sabbath perfectly, new moon festivals, or for you and I, we might fall into some other temptations to try to earn salvation, to, to earn favor with God. One of those would be um, our political standing. We can become so committed to a political standing that we've replaced Jesus with our view politically. And it becomes ultimately our God. It will save us if the right people get placed in office. Or maybe there's financial wisdom. You, you might be very savvy with investing. And you begin to put your hope and trust in your financial planning. Even though you're in Christ, you then begin to spend all of your energy focused on hoping that this is really what will carry you through. There's our works, how hard we work or don't work. We, we can compare ourselves to others. Ultimately, these are things that we can go back to, the elementary basic principles that ultimately we cannot do this by ourselves. We cannot, first of all, save ourselves. And secondly, only Christ can. And that is the key. 
And so the temptation that Paul's addressing here is don't keep going back to those things. You've been freed from the law. Those idols you worshiped for the, those who were the pagans of this culture in this day, those idols are worthless. They're not worth your energy. And so we move forward then and you ask this question, okay, if I'm free then, if I'm in Christ, what does that mean? It means this. It says that you are adopted. You're adopted. Now, before I unpack a couple of things, the first thing I want you to know is you are not adopted into the family of God. That only happens by giving your life to Christ. When you surrender your life fully, you are born again into the family of God, and then you are adopted. It is part of that, that picture of now you are adopted. So it's not like you and I often think of adoption. And even my opening story, the gavel drops and the judge declares, now you're adopted and now you can go into that family. No, this, this, is, a, this is a very interesting but key point. See, as Paul's addressing, he has to keep talking to two unique groups. So let's understand this. The Jews, adoption for the Jewish culture was not a common practice. They understood that it was by direct bloodline, by birth, that you could be considered a son and ultimately would have the family lineage carry through you, whether it's wealth or just the name of the family, possessions, land, that came by birth. So, so Paul and the others address the Jews to say, you must be born again. Nicodemus uh, asked Jesus, says, how do I enter the kingdom of God? He says, you have to be born again. He's like, how can this be? So for one, adoption was not common to the Jewish people. So he talks about to them, he has to keep reminding them about being born again. This is a bloodline issue. And then to the Romans, though, adoption was a common practice. In fact, what's really interesting is the study that I was doing, the Roman view was this. First, you could actually disown your own children as a Roman. But if you adopted somebody, you brought them into the family, and now they were, uh, first of all, that you, they, you would pass the wealth on through them. So you could adopt someone older than you. You know, I'm 51. I could adopt an 80-year-old for whatever reason. Maybe I know I'm not going to be healthy enough to see my family through. So I adopt a wiser, perhaps more savvy 80-year-old. And in that adoption, some things happen. One, they take on a new name. Just like you and me, we, we take on a new name, child of God. And two, the debts are canceled for that person. Whatever they came into this, this adoption with, it's, it's cleared. All the debts are canceled, just like you and me. Three, they're entitled to all the rights and the benefits of the adoption. So when they're adopted into the family, everything is theirs, full access to everything. Um, four, it's irreversible. This is, that's what's so intriguing. The Romans said you can disown your own family member, your own child, but if you adopt somebody, it is irreversible. It is final. It's finished. There, you cannot change it. And so Paul's addressing both of these in this picture of adoption. But see, you and I, we often only view adoption from uh, the judge says, yes, I take this child into my home. I adopt them. They see it as I accept. I come into this family as adopted. And we often don't have the deep cultural context. But there's a spiritual implication. This is really critical, the, the spiritual view. What does that mean for you and me, though? So if, if I'm not adopted into the family of God, that I can only be born again, but if then I am adopted, what does that really mean? What does that mean? And let's look at the text. It says this, but when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons. Because as you are, excuse me, and because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. This is an incredible understanding we must get to right now, this, this big deal. First of all, it says, but when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son. This is in reference to the coming Messiah. Jesus came. 
This is the first coming, the important moment. And so if you had lived in that time, you might be asking the question back then, why is God taking so long? <laughs> is he just sleeping? What's going on? It seems like we've been, you know, for the Jews, we've been Jews for a long time, thousands of years. But see, God isn't slow. In fact, it says he's patient. And it says when the fullness of time came, in other words, when the time was right for Jesus to come back or come to earth for the first time, to show up as the, the Messiah, as God in the flesh, Emmanuel, as we'll be worshiping that, that perspective in the Christmas season. Emmanuel, God with us. It says he was born of a woman, born under the law, born into the Jewish line that was promised through Abraham to redeem those who were under the law. First, it was meant to go to the Jews. And of course, this, this challenge is that, that many didn't receive that. But to those who do and those who did and those who will today, you receive the adoption as sons. Now, if you are one of the ladies in the room, a girl, a woman, if you're here and you're going, Where's, what does that mean for me? This is not about the gender. This is an important truth in the culture of that day and the understanding. This is a position. You see, the firstborn son is the only one who could receive the inheritance, the, the lineage of the family. This, is, this was critical. When, when the Romans adopted somebody, they, they took a position. The position is what mattered. And it says, now you receive adoption as sons. Positionally, you are right next to the Father. You are not in place of Jesus. He is the firstborn, the only true son. But you become a son positionally, which this is why it gets so crazy. It says, and because you're sons, God has sent his spirit into you and our hearts crying, Abba, Father. So what, is, what does this mean? If you uh, know a, who J.I. Packer is, he's a theologian and, and a just incredible thinker. And when he was, he's since passed, but he wrote it this way. He says, adoption is the highest privilege that the gospel offers, even higher than justification. In other words, being made right with God. It says to be right with God, the judge is a great thing, but to be loved and cared for by God, the father is even greater. It's even greater. Adoption, what this means is that, see, God, as the king of the universe, uh, if you look at historical earthly kings, a king could pardon somebody. They could say, hey, whatever the crime was, it's gone, and, and you're free. They could remove debt. They could do all kinds of things. But a king on an earthly perspective would probably send that person into the, the courts and they might become a subject of the king or a servant of the king or they might have to protect the king. But God said, I'm going to go further than just to pardon, just to forgive your debt, just to cancel what you should have had to pay. He says, I'm going to do something better. I'm going to bring you in and call you my son positionally. I'm going to bring you into direct relationship with me. I hope that makes your mind blown for a moment. I hope you, you ponder that for just a minute. Say, wait, so... He didn't have to go that far. You mean he could, have, he could have just saved me from sin and death. But God lavished us far beyond that. He said, no, I'm not content to just save you because my whole goal was to adopt you. My whole goal was to bring you into my family. I love this when you go back to this. This is, and because you are sons... God has sent his spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. This, this Abba, Father idea, this is not just a few words about, oh, that's great, I call you dad. First of all, crying. This isn't a weeping. This is a shout of joy. It's a cry of joy. Abba, Father, this relational word, Abba, this closeness brought to me. Abba, you're my close daddy, Father not just some distant father. This is a deep relational understanding. He says you were, you were brought to be redeemed. This is incredible. I, I'm now your son 
positionally, I have full access to everything. And so I love pictures and and it helps me to, to think about what this means. But I just want you to take a look at, consider this as you with the father. I love the smile on this child. Positionally, I'm in the hands of the father, close to him, adopted by him, full access to everything that God is. My relationship fully restored. Nothing dividing us anymore. Not just saved, but called a child. Called a son. What does this mean if I'm adopted? It means I have full now, full access to the knowledge and experience that God loves me. I'm loved. Secondly, that I'm seen by God. He knows me so dearly, so intimately. He's so close to me. He sees me. And of course, I think I said that, but that you're known by God. You're known and you're welcomed. You're welcomed into his house to sit at his table. And of course, you're granted full access. The earthly king, you would have to go through a series of reasons why you would approach the throne. And here, God says, come, come in and dwell with me. I hope that puts a smile on your face. I hope it it challenges you. But it goes further than this. So you went from a slave to free, no longer a slave to sin, free from the bondage of sin, the reality of death. And so it says now, the third point I want you to get to is that you are an heir. You're an heir. The hard part about reading this for me as I struggled kind of preparing how to share some of these thoughts is my mind keeps going back to the worldview of things rather than the spiritual realities. Because in my mind, I'm thinking an heir. Okay, so if I got a phone call from the most wealthy person in the world, and let's just say that this person has the net worth of $1 trillion. I mean, that's a lot of money. That's a lot of money. That's a lot of zeros, and it'd take a lot of time to spend it. And they called and said, hey, congratulations, you are now the heir of this incredibly wealthy individual. And I would ask the question, what does that mean? What do I get? They'd say, well, first of all, unlimited access to the bank accounts. Yes, that's cool. Um, What else? You can have whatever house you want or multiple houses. It doesn't matter. In fact, you can buy a lot of houses and it's not going to make a dent in this bank account. So go hog wild, have fun. Summer homes, winter homes, vacation homes, uh, napping homes, whatever you want, it's yours. You have plenty of access or maybe it's cars. Maybe you love cars. And so I'm like, oh, great. Finally get that new truck, the brand new one, not the 10 years new to me truck. Um, Cars and boats, food, access to great culinary, beautiful delights. Travel wherever you want. Get in a rocket ship if you want. You got enough money, you can travel to space. But the problem with the worldly view is even a trillion dollars over the course of enough time will run out. It won't last. And and honestly, it'll just be selfish pleasure anyway. So when we come to the scriptures, we have to get a biblical, scriptural, spiritual view. What does it mean to be an heir? What does this mean? Let's go back to the text and finish up here in verse 7. It says, because you're an heir, you are no longer a slave. First point. You're free. Two, you're no longer a foreigner. You are an adopted son. You're part of the family. And if a son, it says an heir through God. So you go from slave to free. You go from enemy to son. And ultimately, you go from empty to the point of death to life to be an heir. And so there are advantages that come with this. And these advantages are so critical. The first thing I want you to hear, it comes out of Romans. It says, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God. What do I receive? I receive God himself and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. We get God. We get God. Not distant 
unavailable, disconnected, unrelational theory God. We get relational, true, living, full love God. We get him. We're an heir. And so I love what it says. If we go to 1 Peter, and let's unpack this for a moment. So if that's my inheritance, if I get God, what does that mean? And 1 Peter says it this way. As an heir, your inheritance is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you. So what do I receive? First of all, the, the understanding is imperishable means it will never run out. It cannot end. You cannot destroy God's love, God's relationship with you. You can't do it. It is imperishable. Second is it's undefiled. It is pure and holy and righteous and beautiful and it's perfect. There's no ulterior motive God has for you. It is sincerely to be in direct loving relationship with him. And third, it's unfading. It's not going to diminish. It's not going to lessen. It's not going to fade. And and in a thousand years, you'll say, boy, I just don't feel like the love is as strong as it was. It will be as strong today as it is a trillion times a trillion times a trillion days from now or years from now or centuries. It doesn't matter. Eternity is a complex idea. But it's unfading. And so what do you get? You get eternal life. You inherit eternal life, but not just for kept in heaven someday. You get abundant life today. If you missed our study on the Holy Spirit, this key understanding is this. When you surrendered your life to Christ, it said he put his spirit in you. You have full access right now, abundant life. The fruit of the spirit is in you and you have full access to love and peace, patience and kindness Finish Galatians on your own in chapter 5 and look again at the fruit of the Spirit. But this is so key. God said, I want you to be in direct relationship with me. I want to call you my son. Positionally, I want to give you full access to everything. There's a lot more we could discuss. I just want to take a few moments and let that sink in. That what you inherit is God, and he will be with you forever. And he will never fade, and he will never misuse you. And like the the child I started with, you don't have to worry if you belong to God. He sent his spirit in you to tell you and to prove to you you are his. And you don't have to worry if heaven will be your forever home. God has guaranteed that to you. He has promised you that. And your home in heaven, it will never fade. (laughs) And it's not going to be destroyed. And so I want to take a moment with you. I just want to pray with you. So whether you're at home or at our campuses, can we just pray for a second and give God thanks as we look to Thanksgiving and celebrating? Let's give God thanks together. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We come to you so grateful, so grateful for this incredible gift that one, you freed us from sin. You freed us from the slavery to sin and death. Thank you for the gift you gave us in Christ. To God, we thank you that in this you adopted us, that you you call us your child, you call us your son, you call us into full access and full deep relationship with you. We thank you. And finally, God, we thank you that this is forever and that you guarantee that. Thank you that you send your spirit in us to, to help remind us of those times that we're so tempted to go back into idolatry, to go back into trying to prove things to you. Thank you that you proved who you are on the cross. We give you all praise. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, thank you uh, so much. I I hope that you're challenged today by the message. But before I kind of get to our transformational moment, I just want to say happy Thanksgiving as you go into your Thanksgiving. I want to encourage you with this idea that you write a prayer of thanks to God and share it with your friends and family as you gather. Um, And if you're thinking that's very private, then write a prayer and give God thanks. It'd be great. But I just encourage you to share. How has God lavished his love on you? How has God lavished his grace on you? In this understanding of what it means to be an heir, to be adopted, to be free, how has that 
perhaps brought you into a deeper understanding of God's immense love for you. So I love you guys. I can't wait to see you the next time. And may you have a great and blessed Thanksgiving.